if you will turn in your bibles to the 12th chapter of the book of romans as we continue our study through the word so you remember the first eight chapters uh book of romans we watched as paul laid out the new covenant the the way in which each and every one of us is uh, saved by grace through faith and and then the question was, what about the nation of Israel? And so chapters 9, 10, and 11 dealt with the past, the present, and the future of the nation of Israel. The past, we see God dealt sovereignly with the nation of Israel. Presently, we see that God is dealing by grace with them, inviting each and every one into an individual relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and what's the future? God has a plan for the nation of Israel. They have not been cast aside forever, but the Messiah, Jesus Christ, is going to return and he will rule and reign in righteousness from Jerusalem, the nation of Israel. And so now, Paul, having dealt with the question of what about the nation of Israel, he's going to move back to exhortations and encouragements. And now that we've been invited into this new covenant, now that we're not underneath the law any longer, now that our sins are forgiven we're washed in the shed blood of jesus christ we're clothed in the righteousness uh, of christ how shall we live how, how should we live as a believer once we have been changed once we have been born again from that moment to the moment that we breathe our last breath, how, how should we live? And so Paul is going to start to encourage and to exhort us into our Christian living. We begin here in this 12th chapter, verse 1. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Paul begins by saying, I beseech you. And so he is appealing to our will. We see that God calls us to make a choice about the way that we are going to live for him. God has given to each and every one of us a free will, and we are to use that free will to then choose God. And so and Paul says, I, I, I beseech you, I plead with you, I, I, I beg with you by the mercies of God. It is interesting there by the mercies of God. Each of us have entered into the new covenant because of the mercy of God. What is mercy? Mercy is not receiving what you deserved. When you have gotten yourself into trouble and you deserve punishment and you don't get the punishment that you deserve, that's mercy. And so people will throw themselves on the mercy of the court when they are guilty uh, and they are caught red-handed, then it is the asking for mercy. Don't give me what I do deserve. Each and every one of us, uh, we were not given the right punishment for our sins that went on to Jesus Christ and now what have we been given we've been given grace and mercy mercy and not being punished and grace we see we have our sins forgiven and we were children now of God so the pagan cultures you were to bring a sacrifice hoping that that sacrifice would then grant you mercy, that you would not be punished by bringing this sacrifice. Here we see that Paul is saying, because we've already received mercy, we're not going to bring a sacrifice to God trying to gain mercy. You've already been given mercy. And so what's the response is, is that thanksgiving now. We're going to bring an offering of, uh, of thanksgiving. And so he says, by the mercies of God, I beseech you that you present your body as a living sacrifice. We see here in light of the mercy, the past, present, and the future, we are to present ourselves, offer ourselves up as a, a living sacrifice. And, and so you have a living sacrifice versus a, a dead sacrifice. The sacrifice of our lives is living because it's brought alive to the altar. And we see the sacrifice is also living because it stays alive. It is ongoing and it is holy and acceptable to God. 
And so here we see that Paul says that this is our reasonable service. And that word in the original language is logical. It means that it's a logical conclusion that, that now that you have been saved, washed, redeemed, that you would allow God to take and to direct the rest of your life. That you would submit, surrender your life to God and let God direct it from there he says that that is just logical that just makes sense he says in verse 2 and do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect uh, will of God he says don't be conformed to this world this world is seeking to conform us into the way that it thinks and and so we are to resist that and being conformed the the world tells us its slogans eat drink and be merry for tomorrow you'll die yolo you only live once in your life if i'm not hurting you then why are you judging me it's my body it's my choice we we see that the world has all of its slogans that it pushes forwards onto us and and we are to resist those slogans we are not to be conformed to the world he says but instead we are to be transformed that word for transformed is the word metamorphosis to be radically changed we see that webster's dictionary defines a metamorphosis as a profound change in form from one stage to the next in the life history of an organism as from the caterpillar to the pupa and from the pupa to the adult butterfly it is a radical transformation from one stage to the next in the life uh, history. And so in our lives, we have undergone this radical transformation to where we were dead and now we are alive, to where before we did not have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, to where now you are the temple of the Holy Spirit which dwells inside of you. And so we are not to be conformed to this world, but we are to continue to undergo this transformation. And how does this transformation take place? It says that be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so uh, the mind is the control center of our uh, attitudes, of our thoughts, and of our uh, actions. And so the mind needs to be transformed, needs to be renewed, needs to be uh, regenerated. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul would write that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit uh, of your mind. And so our minds uh, now uh, being made new by the spiritual input of God's word. It says that we would be renewed uh, through the mind and through the washing of the word. And so it is that spending time in the word that changes us, that molds us and shapes us, that we would be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It is the, the word of God, putting the word of God into your mind that renews it, that washes it, that cleanses it. And so being in the word of God, spending time in the presence of God. And we spend time in the presence of God and in the word of God. The Word of God is alive. It's powerful. When you put the Word of God into your mind, uh, the Word of God then begins its work. God promises, listen, that His Word will never go out void. 
that it will never go out and not have any effect uh, whatsoever. Why? Because his word is alive. It is powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. So you're not just reading words. You are ingesting the living word of God into uh, your mind. And the word of God is going to have its effect. It is going to do uh, its work in your mind and in your heart. And so uh, on a daily basis, we want to be presenting ourselves to God, allowing our minds to be renewed just by the word of God, washing and cleansing and, and filling. It says that, that we might know now what is that prove, what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What we want to do is we want to discover in our lives what God's will is for our life. We have our plans for our life. And then God knows what he created you for. God knows the purpose and the plans that he has for you. Jeremiah, I know the plans that I have for you to, to prosper you, to bless you, and not to destroy you. And so God has plans uh, for your life. But we've got our own plans. And so what do we need to do? We need to let go of the plans that we have in our life to discover, first of all, discover what's, what's the will of God in my life, to prove that it means to test and to discern what is that purpose perfect and good will of God in my life. And then we want to step into that will of God. Paul says that's just logical. If you think about it for a minute, God, who, who has infinite wisdom and knowledge, knows what would be the best use of your life and what would be the most rewarding, filling life that you could possibly live. And God wants to lead you into that life, but you are the one that needs to surrender yourself to that will. He says, but that's logical. Why would you fight against the, uh, the will of God in your life when he knows what is in your best interest? and he loves you and so and here Paul says that now that you're saved pr present yourself to God say God here I am use me in whatever way shape and form that you want to bring you glory you see ultimately your purpose and my purpose once we got saved is to bring glory to God amen to let the world know how amazing God is uh, and to magnify him uh, here upon this earth in whatever way, shape, or form God wants him to do that. And, and so Paul here says that, that knowing what that will is in your life, test it out and prove it, discover it. Uh, he says in verse 3, For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a, a measure of faith. Faith. We see that Paul warns us against pride to not think of ourselves more highly than uh, we ought to uh, here, uh, but uh, to think uh, soberly. Thinking highly of yourself, uh, he is saying, is not sound thinking. It is crazy thinking here. God has dealt to each one of us a, a measure of, uh, of faith, and, and so uh, even the faith, our saving faith, is a, a gift from God. In Ephesians chapter Two, Paul writes, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And so God has dealt with to each one of us a, a measure, an amount uh, of, uh, of faith. And, and so uh, we are to walk in that in faith. He says, for as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. So Paul is going to talk about this new covenant now. And in the new covenant, uh, we have churches. And the church is now the, the family of God. And he likens the, the family of God now to the body and ultimately to the body of Christ. Now, in a body, you have many different parts of the body. You have fingers and toes and eyes and ears and hands. And, and all of them are unique, but yet they're all connected together 
together and they function as one. And so within the body of Christ, we have many individuals, but each individual has different gifts and different talents, but all of them working together make up the whole, the totality uh, of uh, the body of Christ. And so we are connected to members uh, of uh, one another. And so in the body of Christ, there is unity, but not uniformity. I think that that's really important for us to understand. We are called to be united, connected together, but uh, we are not to be uniform. In other words, there is not one model of a Christian, and then we all are supposed to be that model, to cookie cut us so that we all look like one another. God's given to each of us different talents. God's given to us our personalities, our sense of humor, our identity, and so we are not to have this uniformity across but we are to have a unity with uh, one another he says having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us let us use them if prophecy let us prophesy in proportion to our faith or ministry let us use it in our ministering he who teaches in teaching so Paul now is going to start to talk about the different spiritual gifts that God gives to individuals and then how these spiritual gifts are to be used Paul is stirring up the gifts that are inside of us that God has placed for the benefit of the body of Christ the reason that God gave us those spiritual gifts is for the body of Christ and for the edification and the ministering to the body of Christ. He says, if you've been given the gift of prophecy, then function in the gift of prophecy according to your faith. And so as the Lord leads you, as the Lord gives you utterances, then share those, speak them uh, out, walk uh, in them. Now, the gift of prophecy is interesting because when you do speak it out, you're putting the gift on the line by speaking if you utter something that you say is from the Lord and it doesn't come to pass then you not the Lord made a mistake uh, in the functioning of that mm, gift uh, here but it says according to your faith as God tells you and pushes you leads you forwards he says or ministry if you've been given the gift of ministry then Use it uh, in uh, your ministry. Now, in the book of Acts, this very same word for ministry is the word that was used uh, for the waiting on the table. So it means serving. If you've been given the gift of serving, then serve, minister, uh, and be functioning in your gifting. Uh, he who teaches in, in teaching. And so if you have the gift of teaching, if God's given you that gift of teaching, then, then God wants you to be functioning in that in capacity to be in teaching within the body of Christ and and so that was one of the areas that uh, that God spoke to me and, and called me when I was very young in the Lord I remember that uh, I was at Costa Mesa I was uh, sitting there listening to to Pastor Chuck and Pastor Chuck was given the teaching on the parable of the talents and to uh, each one was given a different amount of talent and and then that talent was to be used and invested in and returned back to the Lord and I remember that I was sitting there and just as clearly as God has ever spoken to me in my life God asked me a question he says when am I going to get to use your talent a and I knew instantly what the Lord was talking about that God had given me that ability to mm, teach. I had the ability to teach when I was this high. I had younger brothers and sisters, and I, I would be teaching them how to swim, how to hold their breath. I, I, I was exhorting them and teaching them to, to ride bikes and, uh, and all. I was always uh, teaching. It might have been the gift of bossiness, but uh, I think that it was the gift of teaching uh, manifesting all, all the way uh, back then. And, and God had used that gift of teaching throughout my life but never for him 
he had placed that gift uh, inside of me and I used the, that gift in my own life. And then he asked, when, when am I going to be able to use that gift uh, that I placed uh, uh, inside of you? And my answer was, uh-oh. <laughs> that was the first time that I uh, heard the audible call of, uh, of God in my life. But whatever gift uh, that you've been given and God gives us uh, all different gifts, we see See, what Paul is saying is to discover those gifts and start using them for the benefit uh, of the body of Christ. That's why you were given those gifts. He says, he who exhorts, uh, he says in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So uh, we see additional gifts uh, here. He who exhorts, this is the, the gift of exhortation and, uh, and the gift of exhortation. There are those people that are just such encouragers and, and no matter when you see them, they're always encouraging you. They always have this uh, this encouraging word and uh, and so everybody needs encouragement so if you have that gift of encouragement function in it encourage and and exhort uh, others he who gives with uh, liberality god has blessed uh, people and uh, and he calls them to to give and so uh, here we see that paul exhorts in that gifting of giving to to do it liberally to do it in general generously because God is the one that has blessed us with our possessions and he's looking for faithful people through whom which he can direct he will give them more so that they can be generous uh, with the, the giving uh, that God is giving to them so that he can direct it he's looking for faithful men and women that he can trust uh, with wealth so that he can can direct them to be obedient uh, with that giving and so if you've been given that gift he says uh, here if you've been given the gift of giving then then with liberality he says he who leads with diligence if you have the gift of uh, leadership and god wants to use that within the church the gift of organization and and he says here and to do it uh, with uh, diligence not half-heartedly or or lazily uh, we see he who shows mercy that person that is just so merciful to do that with cheerfulness as well we see that whatever one's gift is we are being exhorted to exercise it faithfully as a stewardship from God. So what we are seeing is the call to corporate participation for everybody to jump in and to find a place to be able to participate in the life of the body of Christ. We see that Paul is going to continue now with these short exhortations, these short uh, encouragements uh, now as they relate to our relationships with uh, others he begins let love be without hypocrisy abhor what is evil cling to what is good so he begins we know that Jesus is a new command that I give you to love one another a and Paul says now make sure that your love isn't a fake love God doesn't want us to be phony in our love. He wants to grow us in our capacity, listen, in our capacity to authentically love uh, others. And so uh, let love be sincere. Let it be without hypocrisy. He says, and abhor what is evil. Abhor uh, what is uh, evil. The world tells us to mm, tolerate mm, what is mm, evil. The world has lifted tolerance to a, a, a virtue. And we see here that the, the world tells us to, uh, to let us alone, to accept us, to tolerate us, to make a truce with us. If you will leave us alone, we'll leave you alone. If you won't judge us, we won't judge you. And, and so we see that this is the, the cry of, uh, of the voice of evil. But uh, what does 
does Paul tell us to do? He says that we're to abhor evil. We are to absolutely hate it. We are to hate sin and we are to hate evil. We're to make no compromise with it whatsoever in any way, and shape, or form. <clears throat> and then he says, cling, abhor evil and cling to what is good. Hold uh, on to it and tightly. The world will try and uh, rip it out of your grasp. The, uh, the world loves to take what is pure and to defile what is innocent uh, and to take and to destroy it. And we see here that, that we are to hold on to and to cling tightly to what is good. Be kindly, affectionate, verse 10, to one another with brotherly love, in honor giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Now, as Paul is going through and giving these exhortations uh, here, uh, I want to remind us uh, all uh, that this is not the list that we are to take and then try to become in our own strength. You see, this is the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of each and every one of us. This is what God is seeking to do inside of us. These are the areas that God is changing us that we should be experiencing growth. Remember that Christianity isn't a, a self-improvement program where hey, here we're given the model of what we're supposed to look like and now we're going to discipline ourselves into it. No. Remember that we are the workmanship of God. We have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and God is the one that is going to be working on these areas uh, in our lives. Paul is just telling us where God is wanting to go in our lives and then uh, we are to allow the work of the Holy Spirit. We're to yield to the work of the Holy Spirit uh, in our lives and, uh, and so not to be condemned. This is the work that God is doing. But what do we want to do? We want to cooperate with God. Amen? We want to be on the same page and and yield when God is trying to, to work in an area of your life. You want to yield to it knowing where God is wanting to go. God is desiring to change us and to mold us into the image and likeness of Christ. And so uh, all of these are attributes. All of these are, are manifestations of the character of Jesus Christ. And so uh, when you look at this and then you look at Christ and you see the way in which he lived out and modeled the perfect life. You see all of these characteristics manifest in the perfect life of Christ. He says, be kindly affectionate, right? To one another with brotherly love that gentleness and affectionate and so uh, once again being stoic is, is not the way that god desires for us to live he wants us and to be affectionate men he wants us to be affectionate with our children he wants us to be affectionate to, with our wives he, he wants us to have this brotherly gentleness uh, about us uh, here it's says in honor giving preference to uh, one another that's going back to that humility not shoving everybody else uh, out of the way so that you can go first but preferring others uh, before uh, yourself dying to self serving others not lagging in diligence fervent uh, in spirit and serving the Lord. And so uh, we see we're to serve the Lord diligently and fervently in the Spirit. That's what God's desire for us uh, is. And so God is seeking to move us from wherever we are right now uh, into serving Him fervently and diligently, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saint, given to hospitality. We see all of these attributes uh, now is what God desires. This is the renewing of our minds. This is the, the character that God wants us to be reflecting, listen, to the world around us. Why? Because it's his character. And so as a Christian, we are to reflect God's character 
character to the world that is uh, around us. And so we have to allow God to change our character. He's taking each and every one from wherever we are and then seeking to work on these areas of our lives so that it's reflected to the world uh, around us. So uh, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation. Jesus warned us in this life you will have what? you're going to have tribulation. And so nobody gets a free pass. No one gets a, a free ride. So when you're going through tribulation, when you're experiencing it, we see the mindset that you're to have is to be patient in, in that in tribulation. And know this, that tribulation, God uses tribulation in your life to change your character. And so be patient in it. Allow your character to be changed by the trials that you go through. Don't get frustrated with your trials. Understand that now you have to press into the grace of God. You have to press into the presence of God more. You need the patience in those tribulations. Continuing steadfastly in prayer. And so, once again, prayer is that connection, that communion with God. And so, continuing steadfastly. And so, that is to continue that ongoing relationship with God. Don't ever get too busy that you don't have prayer time in your life. That is that continuing steadfastly. That is the priorities in our lives of making sure and guarding that protection, that relationship with God as being the most important relationship that you have in your life. It is the source of love for every other relationship that you have in your life. And, and so you need the influence feeling of love to be able to go and to love uh, others with the love of God. Otherwise, you're just going to love others in your own strength, in your own capacity. And because we are emotional, we are up and we are down, the outflow of love is going to be very inconsistent in your life if you're just trying to love everybody in your own strength and in your own capacity. But when we receive the infilling of love from God, then we have God's love that we are able to pass out to everybody around us regardless of where we are emotionally in our lives. And so we become consistent in the outflow of love in our life when we are steadfastly, continually connected to the source of love to God. And so that's why prayer is so important in our lives. And Jesus says, you have not because you because you ask not, because you were not in prayer connected to God and receiving and, and being filled uh, with uh, that uh, love. And so giving preference, fervent in spirit, uh, serving the Lord, distributing, it says, to the needs of the saints and given to hospitality. And, and so, once again, having eyes to see, uh, returning to the responsibility of helping others and, and given to hospitality. Hospitality is practicing, listen, it's practicing generosity. That's what hospitality is. And so we are to be hospitable. Why? Because the gift of hospitality is a manifestation of the character of God. God is the most hospitable uh, of anybody. And so we have experienced that blessing of his hospitality in our lives. And so we are to be generous with others, with strangers and with uh, loved ones. And so uh, we see here the, the exhortation in uh, that uh, area uh, as well. We see in verse 14, it says, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. And so, do you have somebody that's uh, a thorn in your flesh? Do you have somebody that, uh, that maybe at work is bothering you or annoying you or your neighbor or somebody even underneath your own roof? <laughs> you know, here we see, uh, here that, uh, you know, what does it tell us that, that we are to do? And it tells us that we are to bless those who persecute you. It says, bless and do not curse. Perhaps Paul was thinking about 
and Stephen and how when Stephen was being stoned that he was praying and interceding or possibly even Jesus when there he was being crucified on the cross and as they are crucifying him he is interceding for them and praying for them we see here the the, the attitude of praying God's uh, forgiveness on those who are mistreating us. And, and so here we see the, the attitude. This is the renewing of the mind. This is now being instructed into what right thinking uh, looks like. This is the way that God wants us to start to see things and the lens that he wants us to start looking through and and then he says, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. We see here in verse 15, the, the instruction here is to be empathetic towards uh, others, to be able to feel what they are feeling. And, and so it says to, to weep with those uh, who weep. When someone is going through a sorrowful time and, and they share their, their sorrow with you, I, I know this as a man, and maybe it's not just a, a man thing, but, but when someone is hurting and they're telling me their problems, I can have a tendency to want to fix them. I can have the tendency of wanting to say, okay, but here's what you need to do. Look at it from this perspective or you know, what you need to do rather than just weeping with them. Rather than just saying, I am so sorry that you have been struggling. I am so sorry that that's what you're feeling. I'm so sorry that that's what you are going through. And to just weep with them instead of <laughs> fixing those who are weeping. And that's a verse that I would be good at <laughs> here. But instead, learning just to have empathy. And then to rejoice when they're rejoicing. When someone is is hitting it out of the park, and you know, there's that tendency to say, "Okay, well, be careful because it's not going to last," you know. And so, you know, you you want to be that ballast, you know, to off uh, set. It's interesting when when they're low, you're trying to pull them up, and when they're too high, you're you're trying to bring them to balance. And and, and that's not what the the word tells us. It says when when they're rejoicing, rejoice with them. What it is glorious when you're hitting it out of the park, just rejoice for. Uh, them and be happy with them and and when they're going through times of sorrow then sorrow with them just come alongside of one another allow people to be where they are uh, and then just minister and meet them uh, right where they are be of the same mind toward one another do not set your mind on high things but associate with the humble and do not be wise in your own opinion and so treat everybody equally he's saying be of the same mind toward uh, one another don't set your mind on high things associate with the humble the humility you hear the importance of humility and the absence of pride don't be wise in your uh, own opinion here and then in verse 17, repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the in sight of all men. You remember that the Old Testament principle of justice was an eye for an eye. And here we see that we're to not repay anyone evil for evil. Back in Exodus, the, that principle of justice, an eye for an eye, what, it, what did that mean? Well, what it meant was that the, the punishment or the consequence should only be equal to the severity of the situation. In other words, you know, in our flesh, we have that that tendency you know that uh, that if you hit me I'm gonna hit you twice as hard you know back again that whatever you do to me I am going to increase it to, in a measure back and and that's that flesh wanting to take vengeance and so we see that there was you know make sure that that the consequence is only equal to it don't don't try and increase it as a, a punishment and so that that was the the justice 
this uh, there of the Old Testament. But in the New Covenant, it says now uh, that we're to turn the other cheek, that, uh, that if someone slaps you on the one to, to turn the other, that we're not to repay anybody in evil for uh, evil and have regard for good things in the sight of, uh, of all men. It means what is good, what is noble, what is honorable. If possible, verse 18, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with uh, all men. We see here that God's desire in our lives is unity. And God always wants us to be peacemakers. He always wants us to be initiating peace uh, in our life. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called sons of God. Remember that Jesus Christ was sent on a, uh, on a peace mission to reconcile mankind and to God. And so reconciliation in unity, this is the character, this is the, the heart of God. Now, it is interesting that God doesn't say live peaceably with all men. It says as much as is possible. Why? Because uh, you need two people to be able to, uh, to be in unity, to be on peaceful uh, terms. And, uh, and so it says as much as depends on you. If there is not peace, we always want to be open to the peace process. We always want to be seeking to initiate peace in any way, shape, or form uh, that we can, but uh, also at the same time, uh, we cannot force uh, ourselves uh, into a peaceful relationship uh, with everybody. Verse 19, beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And so um, here we see that uh, he says, do not avenge yourselves do not avenge yourselves you know uh, avenging yourselves you know i'll get even with you if it's the last thing that i do you know it's it's that vendetta it's that um, seeking that um, opportunity to uh, to punish uh, here and uh, and so we see that um, ultimately our response is to turn the situation over to god and to let god listen defend you God, you see how they're treating me? You see what they're saying? You see how they're acting? So, God, I'm just putting it into your hands. God calls us to keep loving them and that he is the one that will take and to dish out the consequences in our lives. And so that's what it means by giving place to wrath, leaving that in God's hands, leaving the Lord in control of consequences to others. Vengeance is mine I will repay I think about King David and and you remember how Saul uh, was persecuting him Saul was still the king David had been anointed uh, as the next king over Israel and Saul became very jealous and chased David and persecuted him uh, all over the place and twice Saul came into David's hands where David had the opportunity to, to take him out. And if David takes out Saul, he becomes the, the next king because Samuel had already anointed him as the, and, as the next king. But he would not lay his hand on the Lord's uh, anointed. And, and though he could have taken his vengeance, he, he trusted and waited in God's timing for God to right the situation. And, uh, and twice David had that, uh, that uh, opportunity. And, and even when you get the opportunity, it says don't take it. Let, let God be the one. God in his timing will fight for you and will defend you and will protect you. He says in verse 20, Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. For if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire uh, on his head. This is interesting. What, what does that, that mean? We get the first part, uh, feed them if they're hungry and if they're thirsty, give them a drink. But Paul writes here, for in so doing, you will heap coals of fire uh, on his head. Two different uh, opinions uh, on this. Some people think 
that it means that, uh, that by putting coals that destruction will return on the head of the enemy. When we show kindness to somebody who is unworthy of that kindness and deal with them other than uh, what they deserve, uh, that uh, in this manner that, uh, that they will feel guilty and, and it will be like coals of fire uh, on their head. But uh, also there is a second possibility of what uh, heaping coals of fire on their head may mean. And, and that means m more of a blessing. We mm, see here that uh, in biblical times when your fires went out, you needed to cook on your fire. You needed your, your fire for the warmth. And, and so when a fire would go out, you would need to go get live coals from a neighbor, from someplace else that uh, had them, and you would carry them back uh, to your place, and now you would use those uh, live coals. And, and so the, the giving of the live coals could be that, uh, that it is just a, a blessing. I, I believe that the heaping of coals of fire in the Old Testament is a figure or an expression of divine vengeance. And, uh, and so this could mean that, uh, that divine judgment is going to follow. In other words, you love them. And God is the one that is going to judge them. And I think that that's the principle that we've been seeing that's been being uh, laid out. Do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil uh, with good. And so do not be overcome by evil. What, what is that? I think that that means giving in to the temptation to retaliate. That's the, the you've been wronged and now your, your flesh wants to respond. But don't, don't be overcome by that uh, evil and retaliate. Uh, but instead... We see overcome evil with good. Jesus called us to love even our enemies. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. And so this is the mind of Christ. This is the, the character. In this chapter, we see the many different facets and areas of the character of God being manifested in our lives, in our relationships with others. And once again, this is the work of God that is going on in our heart and in our lives as we yield to it. We first want to understand where God is taking, and then we want to cooperate with God as he moves us in these directions. As we close our study here, I just wanted to go back to verse 1 for just a moment where he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a, a living sacrifice, that it would be holy and that it would be acceptable to God. And so there were the sacrifices that you were required to bring to God. You would bring the lamb on the Passover. And, and when you brought your lamb at Passover, you had to bring it before the, the priests. And the priest would inspect that uh, lamb. Your lamb was to be without spot or blemish. Those were the two things that the law said that they weren't allowed to have. Uh, a spot, that means a birth defect. You know, you weren't allowed to give God less than the best. You couldn't have this deformed lamb and you go, that's the lamb that I'm going to give to God. It only has three legs. And so that's the, the three-legged lamb. God, you get that one, you know. Uh, and God's like, no, you can't. You know, that kind of violates the principle here. God wants to bring, he wants us to bring us our best, not what is left uh, over. And so it had to be without spotted also had to be without blemish it couldn't have gotten injured it couldn't have lost an eye because of uh, of infection you go okay that's the one that i am going to give to god so it couldn't be without had to be without spot and it had to be without blemish jesus is the lamb of god and we see that he was born uh, perfect and then that would be spot and then blemish would be sin any sin that he would have committed that would have been sin and so christ was without spot or blemish in his 30 years of living and then offering himself up as that perfect sacrifice that lamb of god 
we see that when we are to offer ourselves up as a a living sacrifice. We see that we are to be holy. We are to be separated, consecrated unto the, uh, the Lord. And so God calls us to uh, holy living and, uh, and to be taking seriously sin and uh, avoiding sin in our lives that we might be holy, uh, that our offering of our sacrifice might be holy and acceptable to God, well pleasing uh, unto him. Him. And so we see that that exhortation to be cooperating with God uh, in the character and reflecting of his character into the world that is uh, around us. And so may God continue to do a great work in each and every one of us as we see the way in which the potter is working in our hearts and in our lives to continue to conform us into the image and likeness of Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. God, we thank you that you love us so much that you are continually working in our hearts and, and in our lives. And, and so, God, I ask that you would just continue. Do that amazing work in us. Conform us into your image and likeness. May we be transformed through the reading of the word of God. Thank you for the illumination of truth here today. Bless us now. It's in Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen.